Hello, and welcome to week 10, Introduction to Philosophy, in which we will discuss Hume section 3 of An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. So this section is very short, only a page long. And the reason why we're still going to take a week on this is because the three principles he discusses in this page reflect what he is going to use for his arguments in section four. So it's it's a good idea to have a strong grasp of these three connections among ideas. That way, when we move through, uh, forward through section four, which is a two-parter, we'll have a solid understanding of what he's referring to. Now, Hume section three will start with of the association of ideas and basically where he this idea of compound and simple ideas came from. Then we will move on to the three principles of connection among ideas, namely resemblance, contiguity in time or place, and cause and effect. Then we will discuss Hume's conclusions. So with that, we will move on to the first slide of the association of ideas. Of the association of ideas. So Hume starts by stating, it is evident that there is a principle of connection between the different thoughts or ideas of the mind, and that in their appearance to the memory or imagination, they introduce each other with a certain degree of method and regularity. So what he's pointing out here is that it is his understanding as he reflects upon the way our ideas associate with one another. Um, how we understand things, how ideas form in our mind, because, of course, we're talking about human understanding here at a fundamental level. He's saying the way ideas appear in the mind form a certain regularity, or they come to us with a certain form of regularity, and that from his understanding or from his reflection, ideas come to us in three distinct forms. The first is resemblance, the second is contiguity, and the third is cause and effect. And really what he's trying to focus on here is how our ideas form other ideas. He's not talking about how our ideas are created from sensory experience, because he already went over that in section two, in that all of our ideas are copies of impressions. What he's doing here is he's trying to discuss, or he's trying to point out how our ideas form other ideas. You know, how we rationalize, how we take a concept of red and then think about a red fire hydrant and then think of the time I slipped on a red fire hydrant and then think of the time my grandfather helped me out when I slipped on that red fire hydrant. You know, it's an association among ideas and that's what this section three is going to focus on of which there are only three, according to Hume. Now, this goes against common sense, because we often believe our mind has this infinite ability to come up with ideas and, or original ideas and things of that nature. And he states, you know, even in our wildest and most wandering reveries, even in our dreams, we shall find that if we reflect that the imagination ran not altogether at adventures, but that there was still a connection upheld among the different ideas which succeed each other. And what he's saying here is that even though common sense seems to dictate that we have this unbelievable imagination and this ability of the mind to come up with original ideas, the way that the ideas are presented to our mind 
comes in three distinct associations or three distinct connections among ideas. And again, remember what he stated in section two, that all ideas are copies of impressions, and that when we believe we are coming up with an original idea, we are merely compounding what we have experienced or compounding simple ideas, something he took from... John Locke's essay of Human Understanding, Book 2. He brings this up again near the end of the first paragraph when he states a certain proof that the simple idea ideas comprehend in the compound ones were bound together by some universal principle which had an equal influence on all mankind. That he is re- basically restating his section two conclusion that all ideas are copies of impressions. And if you remember the pink elephant equation, the simple ideas form compound ones. And a simple idea is an idea that which cannot be broken up anymore. So even the idea of pink can be broken up into white and red, yet white can't be broken up anymore, nor red can be broken up anymore. You know, so orange can be broken up because it's a combination of yellow and red, but red itself cannot be broken up. Therefore, red is a simple idea. And the combination of pink is a compound idea because it's a combination or a compound of the simple ideas. And, of course, the pink elephant is a combination or a compound idea because it's the combination of many simple ideas. So that's what he means when he says simple and compound ideas, something he took from John Locke. But he believes this to be a universal principle. This applies to all mankind. Ideas are copies of impressions, and what we believe to be original ideas are just compound ideas from the simple. Nevertheless, ideas are copies of impressions, and the way ideas are formed or regulated within our minds comes from three distinct connections. You know, these, mo- these ideas associate themselves with these three connections. And with that, we're going to move on to the first connection and explain how those thoughts are presented to our minds. The first association of ideas, resemblance. Now, when he talks about resemblance, he states how a picture naturally leads our thoughts to the original. You know, it can be thought of as triggering something previously experienced. And that's very important here because it has to be something that we previously experienced in order for it to be resemblance. And we pass from one idea to the next. So if you take this picture on the bottom right hand corner of this kid playing with a fire truck, you could look at this picture and the fire truck itself could lead you to another idea where you see the fire truck and then you imagine a toy you had that resembles that fire truck. So now you have gone from one idea, the idea of that picture as it's been impressed on your mind, and it leads to another idea previously experienced, i.e. the playing with the fire truck or a fire truck like that when you were a little kid. Or it could even go to that fire truck resembles a certain hero you enjoyed when you were a kid. And so you pass from the idea of the fire truck to the idea of Optimus Prime. It's Basically stating how one idea that is imprinted on your mind becomes another idea through the association of resemblance. Now, this happens to me when I see somebody who may look like my father. You know, I immediately think of my father. And I might even think of a time where my father smiled in the same way that person was smiling or or when my father was wearing a shirt that resembled that shirt. 
It's resemblance when one idea passes to another idea that was previously experienced. And with that, we'll move on to the second principle of connection. The second association of ideas, contiguity. As Hume states, or gives an example, the mention of one apartment in a building naturally introduces an inquiry or discourse concerning the others. For example, when somebody talks about how noisy the people are upstairs and how they can hear it through their apartment, another person will talk about how it's noisy in their apartment as well. Or a person will talk about how the floors in their apartment is hardwood and therefore doesn't have any rugs, so the people underneath them must think they're loud as well. These thoughts are connected by a principle of contiguity because all the objects are geographically approximate to each other in a specific time and place. You know, when I see an international scout sitting in somebody's garage, I'll immediately remember working on a scout similar to that, which is which is resemblance, at my grandfather's house. But then I will go into the log fence that bordered us, the lychee tree in the background, the freshly cut grass. See, those things aren't resemblance, you know, because I didn't see grass. I didn't see the logs. I didn't see things that resembled that. What I did was, is I went from an idea, the international scout, to contiguity because I started imagining what other things were like at that particular point in time. The log fence, the lychee tree, the freshly cut grass, things of that nature. So the way our ideas form other ideas in addition to resemblance is contiguity because we can often think about things associated with a particular idea at that point in time. The color of the swimming pool water, whether it was nice and blue or it was disgusting and green. The, the look of the chairs that bordered the pool or the look of a, the carpet in your particular house forms a resemblance to the carpet when you were a kid, but then contiguity comes in and you remember where the TV was facing, where the dining room table was fixed. So you can see how contiguity is different than resemblance because resemblance can lead us to things that resemble that particular idea, but contiguity, our experience at a particular point in time, can lead us to ideas that are associated with those experiences at that particular point in time. For me, the scout turns into the log fence, the lychee tree, the freshly cut grass, things of that nature, even down to the smell of the garage itself with the oil mixed with the gasoline. So that is the association of ideas, contiguity. And with that, we're going to move on to the last association of ideas. The third association of ideas, cause and effect. As Hume states, cause and effect is when we observe an event and it leads to an inquiry as to the cause of the event. You know, he gives the example that when we think of a wound, we can scarcely forbear reflecting on the pain which followed it. And when you see a particular cut, you can reflect on the pain that would follow that particular cut, cause and effect. I like to think about Sherlock Holmes, and that's why I have the the picture of the detective following the footprints. You know, Sherlock Holmes will look at a crime scene and he'll use his mind's ability to associate cause and effect to figure out where the perpetrator was standing, what was used, where he escaped. You know, he'll look at the footprints and he'll see how far the indentation goes down. Therefore, how much did the person weigh approximately? Um, If there's 
ashes on the side of the footprints. He can come to a idea of association on what kind of cigarette or cigar the perpetrator was using. You know, when we see an accident on the side of the road, I don't know about you folks, but this happens to me all the time. I'll look at the location of the smashes and, you know, where the cars are situated when I arrived. And my mind will naturally try to figure out, you know, who was at fault. You know, because we've got to blame somebody, right? So we'll look at, oh, well, that person's uh, smash is on the left-hand side. Um, the person who's facing the flow of traffic smashes on the right-hand side. Oh, I bet you that, uh, that other guy was trying to cut them off and so went into traffic, causing the person who had the right-of-way to get smashed on the right-hand side while the other person's driver's side left front fender was, was busted. You see, our minds have these natural ability of association from ideas or, or experiences to go into cause and effect. And cause and effect is very important later on in section four uh, because it's used as one of his big demolishing arguments on rationalism. But if we can understand how cause and effect is an association of ideas, that will go a long way. Because our ideas that are impressed upon us can naturally lead us to form new ideas from the relationship of cause and effect. And with that, we'll go into Hume's conclusions. Hume's conclusion to section three. So Hume states that, but that this enumeration is complete and that there are no other principles association except these may be difficult to prove to the satisfaction of the reader. You know, he admits that the people who are reading this may be skeptical that that is all the associations, that there are only these three associations of ideas. But then Hume states, you know, but the more instances we examine and the more care we employ, the more assurance shall we acquire that the enumeration which we shall form from the whole is complete and entire, that the more instances we come up with that we come up with or the more uh, ideas that we form by associating through other ideas we shall prove more and more that there are only these three it, that these three complete the entirety of the association of ideas so Hume is admitting that there is no reason to state that these three and only these three principles of association are the entirety, but he cannot think of any others that would be needed at this fundamental level. And some people may try to give you know counterexamples. For example, if you think about the association of idea of contrast, you know, opposites. When I see a black bird and they immediately think about a white knight. You know, and I say, ha, that, that's uh, an association of idea of contrast. That's not contiguity. That's not cause and effect. That's not resemblance. Hume would say, well, that's just a compound of associations. You're compounding the three associations of ideas. And this is how. My example of a black bird becoming a white knight is a compound association of resemblance and causation. The black is by cause and effect can become white, as I often witness the night become morning. So the idea of something that is black becoming something that is white comes from my association of cause and effect because I often see things that are dark become light. And the white, from that resemblance, now that I have the idea of white, resem resembles that which is holy, and then the holy becomes the resemblance of a knight. So, he shows that even though we believe we're coming up with original associations, as we believe we're coming up with original ideas, we are just compounding the simple 
Or in this case, we're compounding the three fundamental associations. And again, he challenges the reader. He's like, well, if this is incorrect, I challenge you to come up with an association of ideas that is not a compound of one of the three or all three fundamental principles of association that he has brought up. And with that, that ends section three. As I stated, this is a short section. I wanted to give an entire week because section four is really the meat of the entire inquiry. So I want to be able to give you guys maybe just a little bit more time than a week to go over section four. So if you want to start section four early, I highly recommend that. There is no quiz for section three. There is a discussion board. So go ahead and post a discussion board and response. And then I will see you next week for section four, which, as I stated, is the meat of the entire inquiry, where he really brings up these devastating arguments towards the foundation of rationalism. Have a great week.